Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and welcome to my living room in Bolton Hill for another of our five minute histories videos. Yesterday we covered the Bolton Hill Blue Plaque program um, that puts blue plaques celebrating famous people who lived in the houses in Bolton Hill. And I received a couple emails asking whether there were any women who had blue plaques. And the answer was, I didn't know. Um, so yesterday, I set out to try to find out whether there are any women who have blue plaques. And lo and behold, there are. There are two blue plaques that, uh, that have uh, information on two sisters. So we actually get four women out of two plaques. And today, I thought we would talk about cast iron architecture, but instead, I think we're going to switch and we're going to talk about the women of Bolton Hill Blue Plaques, um, and maybe we'll pick up cast iron architecture sometime later. So the first, uh, first Blue Plaque I want to cover is for, and let me get the address right, Alice and e uh, Edith and Alice Hamilton at 1314 Park Avenue. And Edith, Edith and Alice were born uh, in New York. Um, they grew up on their family's estate in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And uh, on the Mother's Day episode way back when, I think I said that I would try to fit in a tie to Fort Wayne because that's where my mother-in-law lived. Um, and the tie just fell out of the sky. So here's our Fort Wayne Baltimore tie. But they grew up in this estate in Fort Wayne. Um, and Edith went on to graduate from the Bryn Mawr uh, College in Pennsylvania. If you recall, Mary Elizabeth Garrett from a prior video helped prop up that college financially. And then Edith went on to become the headmistress of Bryn Mawr School for Girls here in Baltimore. And again, Mary Elizabeth Garrett founded that school to help advance women's education. So a, a neat Baltimore tie there. Um, Edith did a lot of great things at Bryn Mawr. In fact, there's a library named after her, uh, as well as a uh, scholarship program, I, I mean a scholars program um, named after her at Bryn Mawr. Um, but it was after she retired that she really gained national fame. Um, she, at age 62, started writing, and she wrote a book called The Greek Way, um, and then later a, a book called The Roman Way. And these books celebrated uh, sort of classical, the golden age of classical antiquities, um, and got people to fall back in love with that. Um, all right, her sister, uh, Alice, was also a superstar. Um, she had graduated from medical school in Fort Wayne, went on to become a doctor. She worked at Hall House um, in Chicago, the famous uh, institution to try to help working people. Um, uh, and in fact, she was Jane Addams, the founder of Hull House. She was Jane Addams' personal physician as well. In 1919, she uh, got national acclaim by becoming the first female uh, appointed as a professor at Harvard in any field. So pretty neat there. Although uh, Harvard still would not allow her admission into the faculty club or uh, on, uh, the male professors got apparently complimentary tickets to Harvard football games and she didn't get that. So maybe yay for Harvard for uh, doing that advance, but boo for being so petty about it. Um, but Alice uh, gained uh, total fame nationally, internationally, for her work in, in uh, uh, industrial toxicology. Um, and this was in an age in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, when America was really booming in the industrial age. Um, and she was drawing attentions to hazard like, hazards like lead exposure, particularly in gasoline. She lobbied to try to have uh, to prohibit lead from being added to gas, unsuccessfully, unfortunately. Um, things like mercury in the hatting profession for hatters, um, and things like carbon monoxide poisoning, especially in the steel industry. Um, so although industrial toxicology is not a, a, a term we uh, commonly find today, um, her breakthroughs uh, at Harvard, and including um, stints at Johns Hopkins, that's how she got her name on the plaque, it's because she lived with her sister um, when she was here at Hopkins, um, uh, really advance the ideas of workplace safety. All right, on to our second blue plaque, and that's the Cone Sisters um, on 1701 Utah in the Marlboro Apartments. Uh, we talked about the Cone Sisters a little bit in a prior video um, with, uh, with featuring Gertrude Stein, and we're going to get back to that. Um, the sisters were born of parents who were German-Jewish immigrants. Um, they immigrated to uh, Jonesboro, Tennessee, started a grocery store, did pretty well, um, uh, but moved to Baltimore. The Cone sisters went to Western Female High School, for those of you who in Baltimore who want to know where everybody goes to high school. Um, uh, and it's their brothers, though, who moved back to Jonesboro and founded a textile mill, and they became incredibly successful, um, eventually becoming what's now called International Textiles. And, um, and they helped fund the Cone sisters in their collecting. 
Um, and um, Mary Bell Cohn, Etta Cohn, Mary Bell, uh, graduated from a women's medical school here in Baltimore um, and became a doctor. Etta uh, graduated from Western High School um, and really ran the house. They had adjoining apartments at uh, Marlboro Place. Um, and their art collecting uh, started in 1898, I believe, when one of the brothers gave Etta $300 to buy some artwork. And she, she bought uh, a number of paintings, pretty conservative, um, but things changed in 1905 when they went to Europe and stayed with their friend Gertrude Stein, another Baltimorean, uh, now expatriate. Um, and Etta got introduced to a young artist named Pablo Picasso. And she uh, sort of felt sorry for the starving artist, sorry for a starving Gertrude, and bought uh, paintings um, from this young artist. Incidentally, back in Baltimore, she, um, she uh, bought a number of paintings throughout her life from MICA students to help them get their starts. The big breakthrough came when uh, Clarabelle decided enough of the small stuff, she was gonna buy big, and she bought Ma uh, Matisse's Blue Nude. They went on to buy Matisse and Picasso, um, uh, Cezanne, uh, Paul Gauguin, um, and in fact, the 500 pieces of Matisse's that they collected are the largest of any in the world. Um, uh, when Clarabelle died, and they, they collected and put this artwork all over their apartments in the Marlboro, including apparently stacking painting on painting on painting, uh, even in the bathrooms. When Clarabelle died, let me read this quote, she gave her, she willed her artwork to her sister, Etta, um, and she said that uh, it was Etta's, uh, but it eventually should go to the Baltimore Museum of Art, but only, quote, if the spirit of appreciation of modern art in Baltimore should improve. Um, so apparently when Etta died, it had improved uh, and the BMA got the collection, which one article I read said is now valued at over a billion dollars. <coughs> um, all right, we're going to move on to our final, uh, final uh, blue plaque, and that's uh, 1716 Bolton Street, Mildred Atkinson. Um, she doesn't yet have a blue plaque, but hers is on its way. Um, the, I think a new crop is supposed to appear in June, hopefully, and she'll be one of those. Um, and she, uh, if you recall, the criteria to get a blue plaque is you have to have done something important and you have to either be dead or be over 100 years old. And Mildred Atkinson um, certainly qualifies. Um, she did a bunch of things important, which we'll talk about, and she died in 2014 at the age of 105. So she, was, uh, she lasted a long time. Um, she, uh, one of the things she did uh, was in the 1940s, she joined the Citizens Planning and Housing Association. A, a national pioneering group that was uh, trying to do public policy, uh, righting the wrongs of some urban ills. Um, she was a tenant advocate uh, in the 1940s. In the 1950s, um, she advocated of remo to remove outhouses uh, and replace them with running water toilets. You can't, it's hard to believe, 1950s, we had a peak of almost a million people in Baltimore, and she still, in a two-year period, was able to uh, uh, remove almost 5,000 outhouses and replace them with toilets. In 1960, she accompanied Morgan students on a protest to Hoshul Cone downtown to uh, try to desegregate downtown's department stores. Um, uh, to the surprise of everybody, Hoshul Cone's uh, um, president announced that that day all people, uh, all races could eat in their restaurants. So she found herself in the famous tea room with a bunch of students and she was the only one who had any money. So I think she graciously treated everybody to lunch uh, by necessity. Um, 1965, she helped charter planes so that uh, civil rights protesters could get to Selma, Alabama. And uh, uh, I'm going to end on this uh, note. In addition to all of her uh, important civil rights advocacy and, uh, and tenants' rights advocacy, um, she had what the Baltimore Sun called the longest lasting holiday party um, in, in the city. At age 99, she finally abandoned it. But, but if you were uh, any kind of politician, from a city councilman to a senator um, or anybody, you made sure that you got to attend Mildred Atkinson's holiday party. So come on over again and take a stroll through Bolton Hill and take a look at our blue plaques, and we'll see you tomorrow.